John chapter 3. And while you're making your way over there, just uh, before we share the word today, we've got something really great to share with you. We recently conducted one of the largest membership classes we've ever had at Harvest Time, maybe the biggest. And uh, this weekend, we are very pleased to welcome 51 people into official membership here at the church. Amen. And I'm going to quickly uh, read the names of these folks. I know that many of them have already worshipped with us this weekend. But if you're here in this service, when I call your name, uh, would you stand and just remain standing so that we can bless you today? And I'm going to read these names. Kristen Agneto, Nicholas Agneto, Jay Amahan, Angelo Bellantoni, Antoinette Bellantoni, April Best. I'm striking out so far. Amen. Oh, there we go. Deborah Carlino, Maria Elena Cassesi, Carlos Demata, Patricia Demata, Morgan Dennis, Fabio de Oliveira, Patricia de Oliveira, Vincent Fama, Laura Fazio, Caroline Faraz, Yvette Folia, Sal Folia, Rosie Forlano, Thomas Forlano, Joseph Gallucci, George Gonzalez, Ben Joseph, Shelan Joseph, Yun Kyung Kim, Alan Langsam, Yusinea Lima, Guilherme Lima, Joao Macedo Jr., Marvin Mejia, Elizabeth Norfleet, Kevin O'Brien, Maria O'Brien, Kelly O'Gorman, Manuel Ospina, Deanna Pelly, Nicola Pelly, Elizabeth Pelly, Nicole Pelly. I like when they come in in bunches like that. Lisa Point du Jour, Nina Restivo, Rebecca Ruffin, Cheryl Sleva, Gewan Song, Jaywan Song, Binan Semwanga, Esther Kagwa Semwanga, Hazel Subong, John Sutherland, Kathleen Torres, and Josephine Yusudas. Amen. <laughs> let's stretch a hand towards these friends and let's pray for them, shall we? Thank you, Father God. Lord, thank you for joining, for knitting together the body of Christ. Lord, your word says, behold how good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. And Father, we thank you for sending us these friends to become part of our church family, Lord, in a deeper way. And we welcome them today and we bless them. We receive them in the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you that they will be a blessing to us, Father. Thank you for sending them, Lord, that we may have their friendship and that Lord they may contribute together to what we're doing for the glory of your name with the gifts the anointings the talents the personalities the creativity Lord that you have given to them and father we pray that harvest time would always be a blessing to them and to their homes father would you open up fruitful fields of service Lord for these new members and let them have your grace Lord in all things as we serve together with them and we give you thanks for them Lord in Jesus name Amen and amen. Give them another hand. <laughs> Praise the Lord. John chapter 3, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 22. I'm excited to preach this word because this is the awake crowd. Amen. You know, your clock is lying to you about what time it is, right? You know, David said in the Psalms, I will awaken the dawn and in the old King James Bible, if you know, he said, I will prevent the dawn. How many of you want to prevent the dawn this morning when you got up? Amen. All right. John 3 and verse 22 says, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now, John, and that's John the Baptist. It's not John who is the author of this gospel. It's John the Baptist also was baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you've testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. I want to share with you this morning on this topic, for the glory of the sun, 
for the glory of the Son. Let's pray and let's invite the Holy Spirit to minister to us through the word this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gift of your word. Lord, it is the lamp for our feet and it's the light for our pathway. Jesus said that the word of God is like seed. So Father, we give you our hearts in this time and we pray that our hearts might be good soil, soil that can receive and retain and bear fruit from the seed of the word of God. Jesus said that the words he speaks to us, they are spirit and they are life. So Father, would you send your spirit now and minister life to the people of God from the scriptures. If you agree with that, would you say amen, amen. and amen. Well, for the last uh, few weeks, Pastor and I have been sharing a series of messages focusing on Jesus, our magnificent obsession. And we've talked about how Jesus is the only obsession that brings people life instead of destruction. He's not just another piece of the puzzle. He's more than just a little spice that we can add to our lives to make us more well-rounded. No, the Bible says that he is the preeminent one. He is the one who gives us life and meaning. Jesus is our life itself. And together we've explored life's greatest question. It's Jesus asking us, who do you say that I am? We looked at what it means to be a person of one thing, pursuing his presence. And we saw that, yes, Jesus loves us. We talked about how we need to get wasted. And if you remember, that means to become intoxicated with extravagant love for the Son of God. And last week, we talked about the Helper, the Holy Spirit, who reveals the things of Jesus to us. And now, this week, as we close out this series and we head into the Easter season, the Holy Spirit wants to seal this message on our hearts. Jesus must be the one we love and he must be the one that we live for. Yes. There's a U.S. Army combat unit called the 12th Infantry Regiment. And this regiment has a remarkable history going all the way back to the War of 1812. The 12th Infantry fought at Gettysburg. They landed on Utah Beach, D-Day, and they fought in the snow at the Battle of the Bulge. Our friend, Pastor Howard Ranker, whom some of you know from upstate Connecticut, Pastor Howard saw combat in Vietnam as part of the 12th Infantry. And uh, in recent years, my son has been to Afghanistan now three times serving with the 12th Infantry. And uh, I was intrigued to learn that this regiment has an interesting motto. And for all you Latin scholars out there, their motto is Ducti Amore Patriae. And that means men who are led by love of country. For 200 years, soldiers of the 12th Infantry have been willing to face danger because they were led by love of country. Their battle flag carries that motto to remind them of why they do what they do. It's a noble motto and it expresses a noble motivation. You and I are also being led by something. Every one of us, whether we know it or not, has a motto that describes what we do and why. Maybe you and I don't sew it on a flag, but yet it's emblazoned on our hearts because of how we live. And people who observe our lives can read our mottos and sometimes they can see our motivations. You know, some people live by that motto that says, it's all about the money. It's all about the Benjamins. Some people live out that motto that says, I'm looking out for number one. And I've had people literally tell me, maybe you have too, hey, you got to look out for number one. I'm in it for what's in it for me. Others live by a very ancient saying that says, eat, drink, and be merry. John the Baptist had a guiding principle that gave him purpose and revealed his motives. And John's motto shaped his actions and his responses. It enabled him to walk free of envy, pride, and selfishness. His motto was this, he must increase, but I must decrease. John decided that his life would be spent in making Christ famous. 
He decided to find his joy in bringing joy to the heart of Jesus. He was willing to become obscure so that Jesus' name might be exalted, so that the name of the Lord might be heard on the lips of people everywhere. And because John loved the Son, he lived for the glory of the Son. That was his motivation. As followers of Jesus, what is our motivation? You know, every one of us has so many duties, so many responsibilities and activities. Life can become a whirlwind at times, especially in this very busy, busy part of the world that you and I live in. But what is my guiding principle? Why am I doing it all anyway? Well, the 12th Infantry is led by their love of country. But as noble as that may be, Christians are called to an even higher aspiration. As a Christian, I can choose to have my banner say that I am being led forth by the love of Jesus Christ. I want my banner to say that Jesus is my magnificent obsession. I want it to read that I want my life to bring him honor. I hope that's your heart as well. And I hope that as time is passing on in your life, you are finding that you're wanting to see him glorified more and more. I hope that love for Jesus is changing your desires. I hope it's changing your pursuits. And I hope it's transforming your motivations. Love for Jesus should be my fuel for living. My passion for Christ should be a fire that keeps me burning for him year after year. Maybe you've had the sad experience a time or two of seeing a friend begin to chase worldly success or maybe sinful pleasures have turned someone you care about away from Christ. Their love for him grew cold because of it. But even those who do serve the master can drift away if we're serving with some motivation other than love for Jesus. How many of you know that working for God out of a sense of obligation can make me resent him? Working for God out of fear will eventually warp my understanding of who he is and what he's like and what he's about. Working for God out of a desire for personal glory is a trap. It leads me to use the things of God as tools to achieve my own goals. Church, Jesus wants our service for him to be loving service. How many of you love Jesus today in this place? He loves us so much, and we should never stop reminding ourselves of why we love him in return. First, we love Jesus because he deserves it. Jesus said that the first commandment was that we love the Lord our God with all our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength. Yes, God created me to serve him, but the Bible says that he created me for his pleasure. Whatever else God may require of me in this life, he first commands me to expend myself in loving him and pursuing his beauty and his glory. Amen. You know, our God is the only God who commands people to be captivated by love for him. He's the only God who tells people to work for love's sake and not out of duty. I think that the believers who've made the greatest impact in this world have always been those who have found themselves amazed by the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. We also love Jesus because he saved us. How could we fail to when we think about his cross? Jesus gave the world a new definition, a new example of love. And it's a love that by comparison makes every other love seem like a light bulb held up to the sun. People that Jesus saves from sin are grateful. And in return, they love him greatly. Jesus said, the one who is forgiven little loves little. I like the old hymn we used to sing that said, oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. We love him also because Jesus keeps on rescuing us. David said, I love the Lord because he heard my cry. 
Some people say, I just don't want to love God or serve God because he did something for me. Well, to that I very spiritually say, what's wrong with you? <laughs> David said, I love the Lord because he heard my voice and he heard my prayers. See, church, thank God that Jesus saved me. But you know what? He has given me a thousand other new reasons to love him ever since the day he saved me. And then we can't help loving Jesus just because he's so altogether lovely. There's no one like him. The psalmist said, you are fairer than the children of men. There's no one who surpasses Jesus in wisdom, beauty, and power. In Revelation chapter 5, John saw those mighty ones in heaven worshiping him, saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing." There's no one like Jesus, and it is right that we love him, and so we do. Why am I doing what I'm doing? I believe love for Jesus is the only healthy motivation. Every other motive for service contains within it seeds of self, self-preservation, and self-promotion. Love for Jesus is a heavenly motivation. It's an impulse that produces good fruit, lasting fruit out of our hearts. It helps me to overcome strength, uh, to overcome sin and go from strength to strength. Why? Because it enables me to voluntarily lay down all of the lesser loves that distract me. Would you pause with me right here and bow your head? Let's ask the Holy Spirit to help us about this. Say, Holy Spirit, help me to love Jesus. Help me to love him the way he deserves. I believe that's a prayer that God will always answer. And today, let's explore the love of Jesus a little deeper together. Let's explore three things that loving him can do for us, three powerful things that can change my life here and for eternity. Three things that loving Jesus can accomplish in my life. And the first one is this, love for Jesus enables me to lay down my own glory. Lay down my own glory. John, as we read, is a wonderful example of someone who laid down his own glory out of love for Jesus. How many of you remember that John the Baptist was famous even before he was born? The Holy Spirit, when he was born, said that you will be the prophet of the Lord and you will go before the face of the Lord. National leaders speculated that he was perhaps Elijah returned or maybe even the Messiah. Some historians estimate that as much as a third of Israel's population went out to see John in the desert. Folks, that is hundreds of thousands of people, which is still a big crowd today. Imagine if you had a ministry that had a third of the entire population of your country come out to hear you. But despite being a household name, I see that John took special care not to take glory for himself or to touch the glory that belonged to God. He had the right perspective and the right motivation. Jesus said, there has never been any man born of a woman who was greater than John the Baptist. Can you imagine receiving that compliment from the Son of God? But despite that lofty praise, John's perspective was that he was only the friend of the bridegroom, not the bridegroom himself. John was motivated by a desire to see that the bridegroom was happy, that the bridegroom experienced joy, and that the groom experienced the complete love and devotion of the bride. I think John used this parable or this picture because there are few things that people consider would consider more dishonorable in any culture around the world than a best man who would betray the groom by stealing away the affections of the bride. In church, we can learn a lot from John's perspective. And remember that we also, like John, are only friends of the bridegroom. Is it okay if we preach here this morning? 
I know your clock is lying to you, like I said, but... But church, when we are tempted to seek the applause or admiration of other believers, let's recall that the church is Jesus' beloved and not our own. Yes, we should love God's people. Of course, we should love God's people. But if we are loving them for our own aims, we will end up poisoning our own spirits as we seek to glorify ourselves. In John 3.29, John said, He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Have you ever been to a wedding? There is rejoicing. And the friend of the bridegroom rejoices because he can hear the groom rejoicing. And so John said, Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. Jesus is the one who has the bride. So let us always encourage people to love Jesus and to look to him rather than to create a following for ourselves. John's joy was fulfilled because people had come to be in love with Jesus, which was as it should be. For John or any of us to behave otherwise is something that is unworthy of a friend. Let's never seek to gain from others the glory that belongs to Christ alone. If we really love Jesus, we won't desire to. We can adopt John's motto, he must increase, but I must decrease. You know, church, sometimes we don't always get along with other believers the way we should. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but... Well, thank God that this, this is a house of peace. This is a good house of God's peace is here. I'm being light with you. But sometimes we don't always get along with people the way we should. And it may be that we are facing the temptation that John must have faced. The temptation to be envious or resentful of what others have received. John had known for years that he was really just preaching to prepare the way for somebody else. But when that greater one appeared, John refused to yield to envy. In verse 27, he said, A man can receive nothing unless it is given to him from heaven. What a beautiful perspective. It's a point of view that sets me free. It lets me enjoy what I have, and it also lets me enjoy seeing what others have been given. It lets me be glad for them instead of envying them. You know, instead of being envious because someone is richer or because somebody is more athletic than me, which is not really difficult anymore. <laughs> I'm just trying not to compete on the scale with those mega trusses, amen. But instead of being envious because somebody has a talent or has a position that I wish I had, let's allow the Lord to change our hearts so that we can say, look how God has blessed them. See, we can pray for that person and say, God bless them in that gift and help them to use it for you. See, we can be secure in what God has made us to be because we can look into the word of God and see what God says, that we are his workmanship, his poema in Greek, his masterpiece, his work, his fine finished work created in Christ Jesus for good works. God has made you a masterpiece and you possess unique gifts, a unique mixture of giftings and anointings and personality. There is nobody like you. Turn to your neighbor and say, there's nobody like you. And God has prepared good works for you to do, church, that nobody else can do. You can contribute something to the kingdom of God that nobody else has to offer. Praise the Lord. Now, on the other side of that coin, we can also choose to voluntarily lay down every kind of boasting and glorying in ourselves. We can choose not to do anything for the sake of advancing our own glory. See, Paul told the Philippians, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. There's a Greek word, it meant empty glory, vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each one esteem others better than himself. May the Lord help us not to boast 
or to react defensively when we feel that our place in people's hearts is being threatened. I better say that again because it didn't sting me enough yet. So may the Lord help us not to boast or react defensively when we feel that our place in people's hearts is being threatened. You know, way back when, many moons ago, we used to sing a song here from Maranatha Music. How many of you remember the old Maranatha worship? Oh, look at that. Okay. Well, some of the Harvest Time old-timers here will remember it. Uh, Emil, Rosanna, you'll remember we used to sing a song from James chapter 4. It said, humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up higher and higher. Let's humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord and let's allow him to take care of our reputation. Christ is the one who's given me what I have and enables me to do whatever it is that I'm doing. And he alone deserves the glory. And so if I really love him, then I can live by John's motto. He must increase and I must die decrease. Three powerful things that love for Jesus enables me to do. First, love for Jesus enables me to lay down my own glory. And the second one is this, love for Jesus enables me to live for his glory. Because I live for Jesus, because I'm sorry, because I love Jesus, I will live, I will work for his reputation and his fame. I will start to care about the success, about the progress of the gospel, and I will start to be concerned that Jesus would be exalted in the earth more than I even care about my own success. Love for Christ sustains me. It enables me to work for him without becoming weary, as the Bible says, in doing what's good. The more I seek him in prayer, the more I seek his face in worship, the more I see his beauty and his glory, then the more the Holy Spirit also will increase my love for him, and that in turn increases my commitment to serve him in love. Love for the Savior becomes the fuel for my service. And so I keep bearing fruit year after year. I can keep bearing fruit for him because love is the fuel for my service. And it doesn't depend any longer on the strength of my will or the strength of my body. Working for Christ and for others is most effective when we work empowered by his love. In Hebrews chapter 6, we read, For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown towards his name. Can it really be hard work to work for Jesus? Absolutely. Otherwise, the Bible would not say that it's labor. Will there be difficult days in serving God? Sure. But it's also a labor of love. And the love that we have for Christ will energize me to keep going and do even more for him. And I'm not just talking about the work of the ministry or the things that we do serving people in the church. Paul tells us in Colossians 3 that we can do all of our labors for him. Even work that we don't always think of as being very spiritual work. Paul says, whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not to men. You know, I'm very sorry uh, to hear sometimes that people say things like they consider work to be a curse. But work can be a blessing. And it can feel so much sweeter to work when we know that we're doing it to bring pleasure to the heart of our Lord. How many of you remember that Jacob, in the scripture, that Jacob worked seven years in exchange for being allowed to marry Rachel? The Bible says that those seven years seemed like only a few days to him. Why? Because it says it was because of the love that he had for her. And our service can be the same. Love for Jesus is also a fuel that sustains me in my trials. Paul encourages me in Romans 8 to keep going. It says, because nothing can separate me from the love of of Christ. So rather than quit, we hold on, we cling to him, and we keep proclaiming him because we love him so much. 
And we know what Paul said, that in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Church, Jesus promises a crown to those who love him. Did you know that? James tells us in his letter, blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he is tried, listen, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him him. Now, do you catch that there? In that passage, the Holy Spirit is connecting the idea of loving Christ with enduring temptation. He connects those two. So I need to ask myself a hard question. Do I love him more than I love my sin? If you can't say amen, say oh my or ouch. We need to love him that way. And when we do, we will overcome. Those who love Jesus live for his interest and for his glory. They want to see him exalted always and everywhere. Paul was seized by an urgency to see the Savior be magnified. He tells us in Philippians 3, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Listen, so that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. What did Paul mean when he talked about giving up everything in order to share in the sufferings of Christ? Church, I, I pray that you receive this. Paul's great love for Jesus drove him. His love for Jesus drove him to take the gospel into new territories so that Jesus would be glorified everywhere. And as Paul did that, impelled by love, it cost him something. It cost him greatly to share the good news. Jesus said about Paul, I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul suffered willingly because he loved Jesus so much that he couldn't stop talking about this amazing Christ that we serve. What a magnificent obsession. Love for Jesus will help us serve him faithfully. It will give me strength against temptation. It will change my goals and change my priorities so that I begin to live for his glory. We're talking about three things that loving Jesus will do for us. It enables me to lay down my own glory, enables me to live for his glory, and then finally this, love for Jesus will enable me to share his glory. Love for Jesus will allow me to share in his glory. Worship team, you can come back, please help us if you would. Church, you know, every day... Every day, the Holy Spirit is speaking to us, and he's prompting us to live differently, to live different kinds of lives from the people that are around us in the world. And of course, he does that because he wants to help us to obey God. He wants to help us to obey the first commandment, that we would love the Lord with all of our hearts. But he also does it for another reason. Last week, we shared with you that the Holy Spirit makes us holy. How many of you know that holiness is a good thing? God said, be ye holy because I am holy. Being like Christ, living like Christ, responding to things and situations the way that Jesus would is a good thing. But church, I want you to know that the Holy Spirit is not just preparing you to shine like a light in this world. He's preparing us for eternal life in the presence of God. The Holy Spirit is preparing you and me to share in the glory of Christ. You know, ever since our first parents sinned, God has longed to bring us back to his presence and to let us share his glory. Because of sin, we could no longer stand in the fullness of God. We couldn't stand in his glory. And yet, that is the very thing for which God created you and me, to see him in his glory. He created us for a fellowship so unhindered 
that we can see the fullness of what God is face to face, not merely know about him or know him from a distance. Scripture tells us that this was the very thing for which Jesus Christ died on the cross, that he would rescue a people for the glory of God. In Hebrews chapter 2, it tells us that Jesus was suffering. It says, you know what it says he was doing? It says he was bringing many sons to glory. The Apostle John tells us in his first letter, Beloved, now, meaning already, now we are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him, what hope? The hope of being there and seeing God face to face in his glory. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. John says everyone who has that hope within him will purify himself. And church, love for Jesus, not religious fear. Love for Jesus is the fuel that can empower you to live holy so that we can inherit the promise and gain, win the goal of our faith, which is to share in the glory of God as we serve him forever. This is the promise that he holds out to us. And love for Jesus is what will enable us to inherit it. I have my struggles in life, difficulties, and I know that you have yours as well. And church, some of what we face in life is truly difficult. Jesus never minimized those things. Remember, Pastor shared with us several weekends ago how Jesus wept. But I also want to say that in the light of the glory that awaits us, we can choose to see our struggles as small and temporary. A church, I know this is no longer a popular message in today's world. It's become very unfashionable in America to sing songs about going to heaven, to sing songs about going to see Jesus someday. But can I suggest to you that maybe we've grown just a little too fond of this present age. And we're not all that excited about the age that's coming either. But this was not the view of the apostles and of the early church. They were so in love with Jesus that they longed to see him come in the fullness of his glory. They longed to see his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that love and that longing for him empowered them to endure everything that life could throw at them. And you know, it still empowers people in the year 2016 all around the world, that love to endure the very worst that persecutors can do. Paul said, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed within us. Praise God. Paul said, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is producing for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And everyone who has that hope, John said, will purify himself and live holy. Love for Jesus will inspire me to live holy so that one day I can share in his glory. Brian Kim is the author of the book that we've been reading the past few weeks, Magnificent Obsession. And he asks this question. He says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? Will God accept as his friend one who despises holiness, one who is careless in obedience, one who has no interest in the purposes of God's uh, divine love and no delight in the gospel of Christ? Beloved, the Holy Spirit must make us like God or else we cannot be the friends of God. We must love Jesus the Son or else we cannot love the Father. We cannot rise, he says, to the standard of friends of God if self is our ruling force. God is not selfish, and he is not the friend of the selfish. 
unless we love what God loves and hate what God hates, we cannot be his friends. Our lives must run in parallel lines with the life of the gracious, holy, and loving God, or else we will be walking contrary to him, and he will walk contrary to us. And friends, if you need to overcome something in your life today, if you need to overcome a sin that's plaguing you, ask God to reveal himself to you and to increase your love for him. Don't try to live any longer with one foot in the kingdom of Christ and one foot, as we used to say, in the world. And if that's you today, I invite you, I encourage you to come back to Jesus, return to Jesus and his love. Somebody needs to hear what he says. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Pastor Glenn might say, take a look at where your choices in life have taken you and ask yourself, how's that working out for you? Maybe you're trying to live for Jesus and yet you feel that you've been losing the battle with temptation. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you fresh love for Jesus. Love for Jesus will enable you to lay down your own glory. Love for Jesus will empower you to keep going and live for his glory. Love for Jesus will enable us to share in the glory of the Son as we begin to live holy. The Bible encourages us. It says that he is able to keep you from falling. And he is able to present you, not with just a little sin here and there. He is able to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. So church, today, let's commit again to love the Lord with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. Let's learn to live for the glory of the Son. And may Jesus Christ become our magnificent obsession. Come on, would you stand with me and let's give him praise. Come on, give the Lord a great hand of praise because he's worthy. If Jesus is your magnificent obsession, then before we go today, let's spend another minute worshiping him. I want to ask you if you're willing, if you would join me at this altar, and we're going to take a few moments to worship him together and declare our love for him. We left some time on the clock so that we could sing one more love song for Jesus to express our heart of love, that we think he's such a wonderful savior, and we want him to be our magnificent obsession. And then we're going to pray about the love of God. But why don't you come, and Pastor Jason's going to lead us in singing about how worthy he is. Come on. And all the saints and angels, they bow before your throne. All the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God. Come on, lift your hands and sing that again. All the saints.
come on, lift up your hands to him. Just begin to sing a new song of worship to the Lord. Come on, lift your face to heaven. Come on, if the Lord has graced you with a heavenly language, would you worship him? We worship you, Lord. We give you glory, Adonai, for you are good, and your mercy endures forever and ever. For you are good, and your mercy endures forever and ever. mouth the God of heaven says open your mouth and I will fill it come on we worship you Lord all that praise arise in the midst of the Osiah let the praises of God be in thy mouth Lord. for the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever King of kings Lord of lords living God first and last Alpha and Omega Now let's worship him another minute. Just the voices. Come on. Would you lift up your voice to him and worship him? Come on. You don't need the instrument. Come on. You are the instrument. Oh, Lord, we bless you, Lord. 